We're going on then with uh, the third uh, of the lectures on genetics. And this is uh, by Jonathan Sabat, who's relatively new, certainly within the last five years or so to our nine. Nine, nine. Oh my God. <laughs> Can you believe it? That's fantastic. Uh, I told you. Ten people when I started out, I knew what everybody did. Nowadays, I don't know what people are doing and, and how long they've been here. But Jonathan, professor of psychiatry and cellular molecular medicine. He's the chief of the Beister, good, chief of the Beister Center for Molecular Genomics of a Neuropsychiatric Disease. Uh, he, he is focused on the molecular basis of neuropsychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and autism, and we're about to hear something today about autism. So thank you very much. So la last year, I, I grew my hair out specifically so that people would stop confusing me with Abe Palmer. <laughs> but after seeing that photograph, I realized he beat me to it. Now I, I have no, I, I have, I have no uh, recourse at this point. <clears throat> So uh, obviously UCSD has been a fantastic place to grow the lab and to grow new roots and go in new directions. So much of the work that we've been doing over the last uh, several years has been focused very keenly on autism spectrum disorder. Uh, when I arrived, Lou Judd introduced me to Christina Corsello, the director of the Autism Discovery Institute at Rady Children's. Shortly after that, he actually brought Christina into our department as a as a member of the department, and uh, really that, that was a game changer for me in being able to have clinical populations to work on, which I didn't have at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, New York. So, it, and I can attest to the fact, the value of actually continuing these, these recruitment efforts and, and using them in genetic studies. It's, it's very nice to not be um, just a bioinformaticist locked up in a closet using millions of somebody else's samples. Uh, it's, it's actually very nice to have uh, your own data. So I'll be speaking about autism, uh, and so will, so will Lilia, who immediately follows after me. Uh, and so just we should probably discuss a little bit about what the phenotype is. A very important detail it is a very male-biased diagnosis where boys are diagnosed with autism at a rate of 4 to 1 relative to girls. Uh, these core impairments of autism include uh, disruption of social interaction, uh, difficulties with communication, repetitive behaviors, and restricted interests. And while those are the core features, autism itself is an extremely heterogeneous disorder. Many, many would describe it actually as a spectrum of disorders, or in fact, many different disorders all under one giant umbrella. And so there's a lot of heterogeneity at the level of behavior, intellectual function, and a variety of other traits as well. Uh, and you've been hearing a lot about genetics. Uh, I would say that genetics of uh, autism went from being the most challenging, difficult uh, gen disorder to unravel the genetics to now being the poster child for the success in genetic studies. By all of the available approaches, major uh, breakthroughs have been made. So the genetic, and, and so we can understand the genetics of autism now at multiple levels. So. The, the level which John was talking a lot about in his, in his presentation is the polygenic risk. This is the, what we call genetic background. This is the variation that's floating around in the, in the population, and it's ancient variation. This is, these, are, these are variants that were shared with, with our Europeans across the pond as well. These are not recent things. These are very old variants that have been floating around the population for a long time. In addition to the polygenic risk, there are other variants which carry slightly larger effects on your, on your susceptibility. And these would include uh, rare variants. And by, by rare, these almost by definition are things that were not present uh, on the Mayflower. These are things that have actually occurred relatively recently, several generations back, and are still observed as rare or singleton variants in our, in our, uh, in our sequencing studies. And these carry slightly more risk. Then, of course, you have your de novo mutations, which are a major risk factor for autism. Most of what we know about the genetics of autism comes from these. And these are variants that were not present in your grandparents, not present in your parents' blood sample, but occurred as a new mutation in the gonad and then transmitted from a sperm or an egg to the child. So really, it's a new mutation in the child. And now, more recently, 
we are now with, with, with the sequencing technologies being able to sequence deeper and deeper and deeper into samples, we can start to go beyond that and start to look at variation that didn't even occur in the gonad, but actually occurred somatically in the child during his or her development. And there is, there is very credible evidence for, at all of these levels for our contribution. Um, it, would be, it would probably be um, incorrect to assume that every single level of this is acting in an individual subject. There may be subjects where the mosaic variant is the major risk factor. There are definitely subjects where de novo mutations are a risk factor or a rare inherited variant is a risk factor. But I, I, think it would be, I think it would be going too far to say that every single one of these levels is acting in every single case. I think that would probably be going too far, although it may actually be true to some extent. So the de novo mutation, again, the major success story of the autism uh, genetics. Uh, this is not my work. Every new paper that comes out adds an additional 1,000 or 10,000 samples to the, to the mix. And so every new paper that happens to come out has, has a slightly larger list of autism genes. This just happens to be the latest paper from the Autism Sequencing Consortium. And there are now 99 high confidence autism genes, meaning that the, the false discovery rate in these 99 genes is about 5%. So about 92 out of these 99 genes are bona fide autism genes. Uh, the ones above this genome-wide significant line, are, there's a couple of dozen of absolute genome-wide significant. These are um, credible autism genes. And now once you have all that, once you have all those genes in, in, in hand, and keep in mind, these are a little bit different than the GWAS uh, genes, and that every single one of these is a de novo protein truncating variant that knocks the gene out. Um, they're all heterozygous, so they're all dominant loss of function variants. Um, but essentially, these are, these are all very large effect variants. They're rarely carried by asymptomatic individuals in the population, and they're usually observed as a new mutation in an affected child. So like Down syndrome, they're dominant acting, monogenic forms of autism. Um, looking at these, we're starting to see that there's a lot of overlap with intellectual disability. So in clinical populations of, of mental retardation, you'll see similar variants and similar uh, genes. Although we're starting to also see that there really are a set of genes that are significantly enriched in autism compared to intellectual disability. So these severe monogenic forms, yes, very strongly associated with cognitive impairments and low IQs, but not exclusively. There are uh, these monogenics that are starting to look like they are bona fide autism genes. If you wanna know what biology comes out of them, well, it's very diverse. When you have a, you, these hundred different genes are coming from a wide variety of different pathways, but they do tend to fall into a variety of, of uh, general categories. So uh, the synapse, so these include synaptic proteins. I apologize for going. So synaptic proteins that are involved in neurotransmitter receptors or the scaffolding that neurotransmitter receptors bind to or, um, or uh, synaptic cell adhesion molecules and, and uh, components that are involved in vesicle trafficking at the synapse. So basically everything having to do with the synapse is one component of autism risk. And then the rest of autism risk are basically a wide variety of cell signaling pathways. Uh, protein kinases, transcription factors, uh, translational regulators. And so basically a large proportion of autism risk consists of regulatory factors. And what, what really the commonality between them is that they're expressed at high levels in early fetal brain development. So as you might have suspected, for a developmental disorder, you're seeing developmental genes that are eventually controlling uh, the program of fetal brain development. Now, uh, as I mentioned, besides the de novo mutation, we've now, now with our ability to sequence and to do it in whole families and to do it in much larger samples, we're starting to go beyond these monogenics and starting to understand a little bit more of the complexity. And so a paper we published recently has been focused on the inherited risk in autism. And I'll, I'll kind of dive in, rather than go into the details of any specific paper, I'll, I'll speak generally about how patterns of segregation of genetic variants in autism is telling us a little bit about the complexity. Um, so we're getting a little bit of insight into about uh, genetic differences between boys and girls and how this somehow might relate to this four to one ratio of uh, boys to girls. Well, one thing that's very clear is that girls with autism 
have a much heavier genetic load than boys with autism. And that's evident here from the rate of de novo protein truncating variants. So boys with autism have de novo protein truncating variants, about 10% of them, uh, compared to a couple of percent of, of uh, male control children. The girls have almost nearly twice as many protein truncating variants compared to the boys. But, you don't, but the girl controls don't have, a, don't have a significant difference from the boy controls. So there's no difference in the overall rate of these mutations. And we, don't, we also don't see girls in the population tolerating them more. Um, but it takes, it takes more hits and bigger hits to cause autism in a girl. That's very clear. There's a heavier load. And when you see de novo copy number variants in girls, they're larger um, and more frequent. So basically, girls look even more monogenic than boys, basically. Consistent with it, there being a heavy genetic load required to cause autism in a girl. So when we, when we saw this, we thought, aha, we have an idea for how inherited risk and de novo risk might float around in the population. We said, aha. So girls require a much heavier genetic load to, to get autism. And so there must be girls out there that carry the moderate effect risk factors that might cause autism in a boy but don't cause autism in a girl. That, so girls might be protected. And so if that's true, that would give us a mechanism through which autism might actually be transmitted through the population. So imagine a boy getting you know, a gene-disrupting protein truncating variant in arid one b and boom, he has an intellectual disability or autism. Whereas a girl with the same variant, boom, maybe does not quite meet criteria for autism, maybe has a more subtle phenotype. Um, also, um, as we know well, uh, boys with autism don't have good luck at getting married and having children of their own. And so it's very often this is an evolutionary dead end for that variant. Whereas if some, somebody is, is asymptomatic, uh, would not necessarily see the same natural selection acting on that variant. Um, and of course, with the larger risk factor, you could potentially cause autism in a girl. But the one with the intermediate risk factor might have the ability to transmit that variant across another generation. So we called this the unified theory of sporadic and inherited autism. Mike Wiggler and I uh, uh, wrote a paper on that uh, several years back before I came to uh, UCSD. Now we've actually had a chance to test whether this is in fact the case. So, um, so there's your female protective effect that I described before with the rate of de novo mutations. And now we're starting to, we can measure the inherited risk of similar types of rare variants and, and, and stratify it based on father to son, father to daughter, mother to son, mother to daughter. To, to our surprise, we do not see a mother-to-son transmission bias. We thought that's what we would see. We thought that moms would, would be asymptomatic carriers and the boys would be affected. That's not what we see. In fact, there's a very moderate uh, you know, differential in the rate at which uh, rare variants are transmitted to, to boy cases relative to boy controls. Um, we actually see a significant uh, transmission bias from fathers to sons. We do, not see mother to, we do not see a very strong mother-to-son transmission. So we were very surprised to see this. We do see mother-to-daughter bias. Again, I, I, would, I would take any one of these effect sizes a bit with a, with a grain of salt. You know, the sample sizes still need to be a bit larger. But I think we can exclude the possibility now that, that all of the inherited risk is coming from moms. In fact, most of what we see is coming from dads. Um, why that is, we can possibly get into in the panel discussion session. I don't have time to go into it. So uh, we've started to look generally at inherited risk of different types and look at father, mother, and combined. There's a significant contribution from inherited protein truncating variants, just like we saw the de novo uh, risk. We also published a paper recently on non-coding rare variants, uh, so deletions that affect the untranslated regions of RNA, also deletions of promoter sequences carry risk for autism, um, and that's father, mother, both. Missense variants carry a small amount of, of risk that we can capture, but I'm guessing we just aren't able to interpret which of the missense variants are deleterious and which ones are not. And that's why we're seeing a small effect here. Well, as soon as we get better at d distinguishing the deleterious from the neutral, we might get a better effect there. When you combine them all together, again, all of these different categories, we're seeing a bigger contribution from dad than from mom. So we estimate that about, at least in our cohorts that we're studying, about seven, so we already knew that men contribute most of the de novo mutation. So 70% of de novo mutations come from dad. Only 30% of de novo mutations come from mom. Guess what? 
70% of the inherited risk is also coming from dad. So we estimate that 70% of everything, both de novo mutation and inherited, rare inherited, is coming from the father, which was, again, quite counterintuitive, and we can try to discuss a bit of that later. Um, the polygenic risk. Uh, so we can start now, we can start to look at the, the interplay between the rare variants and the common variants and see, and see if we can tease apart the genetic complexity. So my colleague, Sarah Bergen, uh, worked on a nice project where she looked at the rare variant carriers. This happens to be schizophrenia, not autism. We haven't finished the analysis for autism yet. But in schizophrenia, it's very clear that you can carry a rare variant, but it's not monogenic because there's also a contribution from polygenic risk on top of the rare variant that you're carrying. So there's a combination of, of rare large effect plus small effects coming from common variants. And in fact, you can see very clearly that um, the larger the effect of the rare variant, the smaller the contribution of the genetic background. So, if you, so basically, this is, this is a threshold liability model where um, if you have a lot of risk coming from a rare de novo mutation, you don't have nearly as much of the polygenic contribution. Whereas you, if you have a small effect rare variant, you have a much bigger polygenic contribution. So I'm left with just a, few, uh, with just a minute left. And what I can tell you from that is just to summarize uh, the overall contribution that we're able to capture from whole genome sequencing, and there's more to come. And I can only just give you a one slide of a taste of how we're actually using this um, to actually understand translationally how these rare variants can be um, actually uh, uh, translated into meaningful information for patients. So remember, these are rare variants that are essentially causal variants in an individual patient. And so you actually learn something about the biology of an individual case from seeing, from discovering some of these rare variants. So some of you might be familiar of the, with the gene stargazing because it was a, a, a long ago identified uh, AMPA receptor trafficking protein that was identified from a spontaneous mouse, mouse uh, mutant. And we found a kid in San Diego who has a deletion of stargazing. Um, we've also shown that, that deletion, oh, we've also found others, so there's an a, there's a individual with schizophrenia that has a C-terminal deletion, and there's a in kid with intellectual disability that has a missense variant that also disrupts the, func the AMPA receptor trafficking function of stargazing. And so you, you automatically have a, have a hypothesis about the biology in an individual patient. This kid, you would predict, has, um, has an, a deficiency of AMPA receptors at the postsynaptic density, is what you would predict, um, because he's missing the 30 amino acids from, from the AMPA receptor binding domain of stargazing. Um, and you can test that hypothesis by introducing a similar mutation into a, of a mouse. And we were able to do this very quickly at the mouse core here at UCSD. Within 30 days, we had founder mice with exactly the same deletion uh, losing exon 2. Um, and that, these deletions have a very significantly impaired long-term potentiation. So there's a, there's a very significant effect on memory in these animals. This was done by Gary Lynch, my colleague at UC Irvine, who studies LTP. Um, and again, one of the main reasons for picking this is because there are experimental compounds that actually are positive modulators of AMPA receptor activity, and it really haven't been explored in autism. And so we've, we're, we've now started doing studies with this class of experimental compounds um, and the, the ability to potentially do custom drug discovery for an individual rare disease. Um, and again, uh, it, these are some aberrant behaviors that are actually rescued by treatment of the, of the mouse model with, with this compound, including a you know, deficiency in elevated plus maze, a disinhibited behavior that you see in elevated plus maze where they spend a lot of time in open arms. Um, that's normalized by the, uh, by the um, uh, compound. And uh, uh, an increase in grooming behavior is also normalized by that compound. So to summarize, uh, the, the whole genome sequencing is really making big strides in understanding the genetics. Uh, we're able, there's a substantial inherited risk to autism. We're starting to understand a little bit about how combinations of, of variants influence risk. And again, the rare gene mutations have proven to be very informative about biology, and biology even in an individual patient. So we're now talking about variants that can actually lead to personalized medicine, if you know um, that there's a potential treatment that might work for that rare disease. I'd like to thank my colleagues at UCSD, the lab. My wife, Lilia Yakushiva, has been a fantastic collaborator and colleague. 
um, and, uh, and Christina Corsello from UCSD Psychiatry Department and folks at Children's Hospital and uh, Neuroscience. Thank you very much. So a super lecture uh, that uh, it, it's very interesting for those of us interested in genetics to, uh, for disorders that are uh, almost all of them are polygenic with any one gene explaining a couple of, no, I'll change that, often less than 1% of, of the risk. Uh, and one, one, as one might expect for a disorder this young, this disruptive, that indeed it's a different, it's a different world of genetics when you're dealing with it. It was a lovely presentation.